at Bayview. Um, it will help the speed skating. Uh, and, but it's already a fitness centre being used on the Canadian National Field Chair Rugby Finals were held here in May. Uh, and an interesting thing from here is that uh, to participate in wheelchair rugby, it's just about as robust as the 15-a-side game, uh, so the wheelchairs are going to be reinforced and really strong because, uh, and, and it's mixed as well, so the guys and girls hit each other pretty hard in, in their wheelchairs, uh, so it's a, a really good inclusive sport. So that's great. Um, so we can see that major sports facilities can be used in very much for community sport and for, to get people involved. So a 50 meter swimming pool, yes, competition, training, but with creative programming, with using technology, movable floors, uh, movable booms, bulkheads that can subdivide the pool, you get multi-use, and that's just a, a selection of the uses you can, you can do with pools. Not far from here, uh, well, not far if you come from outside Denmark, uh, there's a velodrome that was built, which strictly speaking doesn't comply with the strictest rules of uh, the International Federation. However, it's the right solution because apart from track cycling, which is very special, very difficult for, for other uses, you can actually, you can train in athletics here, you can play basketball, badminton, and the people from Denmark and I will know it much better than I do, but it's a good example of a specialist facility getting multi-use by good programming and serving the community. Of course, if you live somewhere uh, exotic like Rio and you've got Copacabana Beach, you have uh, a ready-made um, playground there where you can play football, uh, volley beach volleyball, or a combination of foot volleyball, anything you want to do along with all the other activities. But for the Pan American Games in 2007, they turned part of Copacabana into an arena for the beach volleyball event. Great, you took the event to an iconic event, uh, facility, or sorry, an iconic location and you attract the people in terms of, and I'm sure that's what they'll be using in 2016 as well, uh, possibly a bigger stadium. But uh, it's another example. Unfortunately, we're not all fortunate enough to live right next door to facilities or, or spaces that can be used easily <coughs> for sport. Um, and quite often the spaces that have been designed uh, have been designed for adults and not for children. And we've heard already today about how to get the need to get children involved and, and keep them involved. So, we have to design with them in mind, uh, we have to make sure the facilities are close uh, to, to where people live and are readily accessible. And, but children are creative, they can do things for themselves. You don't have to provide everything, you just have to give them the opportunity. But there is a lot of energy in the youth, there's a lot of energy in older people as well, but youth in particular want to do things a bit differently. Uh, and the equipment that's been developed, whether it's uh, skateboarding, inline skates, or mountain bikes, and of course they keep developing, uh, attract us to do, and um, particularly used to do other sports, uh, and, and keep active in a way that uh, we didn't have, we didn't think of in the past, but we've got to think of that. So it's not just about the facility, it's about the equipment and the opportunity. And the opportunity, uh, in many cases, um, it's fine if you want mountain biking, you can travel away into the mountains, but if you live in a city you want something closer because you don't have time or it's uh, difficult to get there. So you have to look, adapt natural resources, for example artificial ski slopes can be provided and here you can see the adaption of equipment to allow people with disabilities to participate. This is an old stone quarry in the outskirts of Edinburgh that's been converted into the world's largest indoor climbing centre. Uh, and these boulders here, for bouldering, move to the sides, they move out of the way or they can be pushed together. But this was converted the world's largest uh, indoor ice uh, centre. Sorry, I was getting feedback in my ears for some reason. Um, so, you know, it's great. You can practice in safety, learn your skills before you go onto the mountains and, and uh, take bigger risks. But we also have to look at the wider, rather than just narrow sport, um, or even when you take in the, a lot of the, the active sports and the new sports that we heard about, the plenary session, by combining facilities. Here in Glasgow, this, this was an old pool built in the late 60s, early 70s, in fact, 
badly in need of refurbishment, the further education college next door, so they created a bridge between the two with one entrance and uh, provided a library, uh, an art centre, and now the, the usage of that is much greater than had it been a standalone swimming pool or had it been a standalone library. It becomes a real hub and a community focus. And this isn't one of Glasgow's deprived areas, and it, it has boosted physical activity by, um, by just providing this up to date centre and combining it with other facilities. New facilities have been built as well. Another example in Glasgow, in another of the deprived areas. Um, where again Glasgow's had this policy about developing new facilities in, in areas of, of special need. Um, but this centre is, is a lot more than just providing the facility. It's actually got a lot of environmental features, uh, dynamic insulation, it's a counter flow heat exchanger that, that relies on the fabric of the building to save uh, or to reduce the heat loss uh, and cut down on the amount of mechanical plants you need. And it provides a good uh, internal environment. It's working very well. Uh, there's also for heating and cooling, under the building there's a, a large culvert, about two metres square, uh, and that draws, we draw air through that. In the summer it pre-cools it, uh, before it goes into the fitness room, the dance studio, in the winter it pre-warms it, because the ambient temperature underneath the building is constant throughout the year. So it, uh, as I say, it, it does both heat and cool by, by uh, walking there, and again that can be done by by simple uh, reducing mechanical uh, equipment. Reduced energy by uh, natural lighting, it gives a better environment. We all like natural light, we all love the, the light. Uh, so the more we can introduce it, it does give some problems for sport and you have to do it carefully, but it's a good thing to do. Um, and equally acts as a, a design feature and attraction and a beacon within the, the community that they can see where they, they want to, to participate. And I always like to finish on a, a happy note. The mermaid's back and made me happy. On Wednesday when I arrived, it was a sunny day. I put another 20 kroner and got my bike and cycled out. And uh, um, I know Copenhagen's a great city for cycling, but when you're on one of these city bikes, people do give you a funny look. Or maybe it was me who were giving a funny look to you, not the bike. Um, but uh, the memory is back, and, and that was great. And what I, I want to do is finish now with another video that, that kind of sums up what I've been trying to say about um, sport, about culture, uh, and, and about the environment that uh, all comes together. And this is a, a video that was prepared by the people uh, who developed the Rio's, Rio's bid for the, the Olympics. And, um, I think it speaks for itself, so I'm going to be quiet now. Thank you. 
Okay, so no longer a candidate city, which is great. Thanks very much for your.